You are my superior officer. You are also my friend. I have been and always shall be yours. Space Station Regular One, this is the Starship Enterprise. Please come in. Space Station Regular One, do you read? We have a problem. Something may be wrong in Regular One. We've been ordered to investigate. It is our intention to introduce the Genesis device into a pre-selected area of a lifeless space body, a moon or other dead form, instantaneously causing what we call the Genesis effect. Matter is reorganized with life-generating results. Suppose, what if this thing we use where life already exists? It would destroy such life. Admiral. Sensors indicate a vessel in our area, closing fast. What do you make of her? It's one of ours, Admiral. It's reliant. They're locking phasers. Ray shields. Zulu divert all power phasers. Too late. Hang on! He wishes to discuss terms of our surrender. You still remember, Admiral. We found him on City Alpha 5. Easy. Easy. He put creatures in our bodies to control our minds. He's completely mad, Admiral. He blames you for the death of his wife. I know what he blames me for. I'll agree to your terms if... if... in addition to yourself, you hand over to me all data and material regarding the project called Genesis. You have proved your superior intellect and defeated the plans of Admiral Kirk. You do not need to defeat him again. He tasks me. He tasks me and I shall have him. I'll chase him round the moons of Nibia and round the Antares maelstrom and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. On June 4th, 1982, the crew of the Enterprise returned to the big screen in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Produced on a far smaller budget compared to the first film, totaling around $11 million, it went on to gross $97 million worldwide. Although it made less than Star Trek The Motion Picture, it proved far more successful financially due to its tighter budget. Fans and critics rated the movie highly thanks to the filmmakers' attempts to capture the magic of the TV series, focusing less on the visual effects and more on the characters that made the original series so popular. With its subject of revenge, the film took a darker direction and wasn't really aimed at younger viewers. Its more graphic scenes and tone pushed the film to have a 15 rating in the UK once it hit VHS, but in later releases scenes were cut down to give it a PG rating. On DVD and Blu-ray, it's been released uncut with a new rating of a 12. Unfortunately for kids, there were no toys available for the film despite a range being produced to tie in with the first flick. Star Trek tie-in toys for the movies were a big misfire during the 80s, when action figures were the best way to capture the imagination of the younger viewers and to build the fanbase of the movie. Despite Star Trek II being action-packed, no toys were attached. After the release of the motion picture, executive producer Gene Roddenberry wrote his own sequel involving time travel. The idea was rejected by Paramount executives, who blamed the poor performance and large budget of the first movie on the constant rewrites Gene Roddenberry demanded, a result of his creative control over the production. As a consequence, Roddenberry was removed from the production and given the position of executive consultant. In steps a new Paramount television producer, who was given the role of producer for the planned sequel. Harve Bennett realised he faced a serious challenge in developing the new Star Trek film. He had never seen the original TV show and had a far tighter budget to work with. In preparation, Bennett watched all the original episodes on 16mm. Harve Bennett felt the first movie really lacked a decent villain, and after seeing the episode Space Seed, 
he decided that the character of Khan would be perfect to bring back as the main antagonist for Kirk and would create a great link to the original show. With this great premise for the film, they were having problems developing the script. A Paramount executive suggested to Bennett that Nicholas Meyer, writer of the 7% Solution and director of Time After Time, could help tidy up the script and bring a fresh perspective. Nicholas had never seen an episode of Star Trek and vaguely knew of the characters. He had the idea of making a list consisting of everything that the creative team had liked from the preceding drafts so that he could use that as the basis of a new screenplay. He rewrote the script in a matter of days which impressed William Shatner and especially Leonard Nimoy who was not happy with the original drafts. Meyer described his script as Hornblower in outer space, utilising nautical references in a swashbuckling atmosphere. Gene Roddenberry disagreed with the script's naval texture and Khan's Captain Ahab undertones, but he was mostly ignored by the creative team. The Death of Spock was an idea introduced to entice Nimoy back onto the project. He originally wasn't going to return, but the idea of his character going out in a blaze of glory seemed fitting, thinking this would be the last Star Trek film. But Nimoy had such a positive experience during filming that he asked if he could add a way for Spock to maybe return in a later film. So the mind meld idea was thought up at the last minute, so his memories would pass on to McCoy to help sow the seeds for the third film. Spock's death was apparently no secret and was widely reported during production. Star Trek fans wrote letters of protest arguing Paramount to change the plot. Test audiences reacted badly to Spock's death and the final scene's dark tone. So it was made more uplifting by Half Bennett. The shot of Spock's casket on the new planet and Nimoy's closing monologue with space featured in the background was added by ILM. Nimoy did not know about the scene until he saw the film but before it opened, he reassured fans that Spock will live again. Sadly, this year we lost the legendary Leonard Nimoy, who passed away at the ripe old age of 83. Beyond playing Spock, he proved to be a very credible star of theatre, and talented behind the camera, directing Star Trek 3 and 4, and Three Men and a Baby. All the original cast members returned, plus a new Vulcan, and new crew members for The Reliant, Kirk's old flame Carol and her son David, and of course the return of Khan. Ricardo Montalban plays Khan, a genetically enhanced superhuman from the 1990s who used his strength and intelligence to briefly rule much of Earth. Kirk defeated him in the episode Space Seed and marooned him on SETI Alpha 5 for attempting to steal the Enterprise. The film was close to production approval when it occurred to the producers that no one had asked Ricardo whether he was interested in appearing in the film. Ricardo was unsure whether he could plausibly play Khan again after so many years. Contrary to speculation that Montalban used a prosthetic chest, no artificial devices were added to emphasise Ricardo's muscular physique. It's all Ricardo's own body. My friend Richard refers to his muscular physique as his chest of justice. Ricardo enjoyed making the film and counted the role as a career highlight. His only complaint was that he was never face to face with Shatner for a scene. I had to do my lines with the script girl, who as you might imagine sounded nothing like Bill, he said which made it difficult for him to stay in character. Kirstie Alley plays Savick. She was replaced by Robin Curtis for Star Trek 3 and 4. Savick was intended to return for Star Trek 6, but a new character was created called Valaris. Savick is Spock's protege and a Starfleet commander in training aboard the Enterprise. The movie would be Alley's first feature film role. B.B. Besh plays Carol Marcus, the lead scientist working on Project Genesis, and the mother of Kirk's son, David, played by Merritt Butrick. The director was looking for an actress who looked beautiful enough that it was plausible a womanizer such as Kirk would fall for her, yet who could also embody intelligence. Nicholas Meyer liked that Butrick's hair was blonde like Beshi's and curly like Shatner's, making him a plausible son of the two, though I don't know where he gets his height from, appearing taller than his mother and father. Paul Winfield plays Clark Terrell. Meyer had seen Winfield's work in films such as Sounder and wanted him a part of the new crew for The Reliant. The film opens with Admiral James T. Kirk overseeing a simulator session of Captain Spock's Kobarashi Maru test with the new trainees. The test is used to demonstrate the character of their command when put in a no-win scenario. In this simulation, Lieutenant Savick commands the starship USS Enterprise and fails the test. Later, Dr. McCoy joins Kirk on his birthday and gives him some old reading glasses, which are very rare in the future. 
Seeing Kirk in low spirits, the Doctor encourages Kirk to get a new command and not grow old behind a desk, making Kirk doubt his new promotion. Meanwhile, the USS Reliant is on a mission in search of a lifeless planet to test a new device called Genesis, a technology designed to reorganize matter to create habitable worlds. Reliant officers Commander Chekhov and Commander Clark Terrell beam down to the surface to check if no life is detected. From their records, they believe the planet to be City Alpha 6, once their Chekhov realizes it's Alpha 5, and they've made a mistake and attempt to leave, but they are captured by the genetically engineered tyrant, Khan. Kirk sent Khan there 15 years earlier, so he could start a new life. Not long after, SETI Alpha 6 exploded, shifting the orbit of SETI Alpha 5 and destroying its ecosystem. Due to the destruction of the planet, Khan blames Kirk for the death of his wife and plans his revenge. He implants Chekhov and Terrell with indigenous eels that enter the ears of the victims and renders them susceptible to mind control and uses the officers to capture the Reliant. He learns of Genesis and wants to use it as a weapon. Khan attacks Space Station Regular, where Kirk's former lover Dr. Carol Marcus is developing the device with her son David. The Enterprise embarks on a three-week training voyage. They receive a distress call from Regular One and Kirk assumes command. En route, the Enterprise encounters the Reliant but can't make contact and then they are suddenly attacked and crippled by the Reliant. Khan is in charge and offers to spare Kirk's crew if they relinquish all material related to Genesis. Kirk stalls for time and uses the Reliance prefix code to remotely lower its shields, allowing the Enterprise to counter-attack. Khan is forced to retreat and repair the damages while the Enterprise limps to regular one. Kirk, McCoy and Savick beam to the station and find many of Marcus's team dead, but luckily finds Terrell and Chekhov alive, along with Carol and David. Khan, having used Terrell and Chekhov as spies, orders them to kill Kirk. Terrell resists the eel's influence and kills himself, while Chekhov collapses as the eel leaves his body. Khan then transports Genesis aboard the Reliant, leaving Kirk and his crew stranded on regular one. In 2002, a director's cut was released. It wasn't extended heavily, only featuring a handful of scenes that added little bits of dialogue. The director's cut is about three minutes longer. Some of the new scenes turned up on TV in the 80s. Many films were extended in length, especially when they premiered. It happened with the first film and the Superman series. Like the extended cut of the first film, the new scenes aren't instantly going to jump out at you and make the viewing experience totally new. This director's cut wasn't made available on Blu-ray, but I'm sure you can hunt it down on DVD for a cheap price. With a small budget and less time, the effects team at ILM had to be conservative with their shots, but also maintain the high quality people expect from them and to at least attempt to match the first film. It's loaded with pyrotechnics, models, motion control, map paintings, all shot on large VistaVision film stock to keep the resolution high when all the elements are combined optically. They didn't have the time to do the elaborate lighting effects that were used in the first film, but instead tried staying faithful to the classic show and only used the effects to help tell the story and not to be an effects demo to demonstrate what they can do. The nebula footage is probably the most impressive for me, shot with moving liquid in a cloudy tank, shot at two frames per second and they had to shoot several takes to get the right shots. Once things start moving in the tank, you had to be quick to get the right footage. They built large models for the close-up of the pyrotechnics. Capturing explosions with miniatures is difficult once you see flames. It can give away the scale of the model, so large props have to be made. For the eel sequence, they made a large rubber ear so they could puppeteer the eel as it falls into the victim or falls out. In high definition, it does unfortunately look very fake, but it's only a minor nitpick and I applaud their efforts altogether. The Wrath of Khan was one of the first films to extensively use computer graphics. That year also saw Tron, but that was trying to replicate a video game environment, but in Star Trek they tried to create something naturalistic or photorealistic. The entertainment industry at that point was not at all interested in computer graphics, so the team really wanted to push what they could do and try and change everyone's mind on the new technology. The computer graphics company at ILM created a minute long sequence to simulate the device exploding on a barren planet and watching it form life in a matter of seconds. The sequence is still pretty impressive today, considering what they demonstrated in only a small sequence. 
The company would later be sold to Apple and Steve Jobs would be the biggest shareholder. Down the line, the company would be renamed to Pixar. James Horner composed a score to Star Trek II. James knew little of the show and didn't watch much TV. Jerry Goldsmith had composed the music for the motion picture but was not an option for the Wrath of Khan given the reduced budget. James Horner said that Nicholas Meyer did not want the kind of score that had been done before, even though Harve Bennett was probably hoping for a similar score to the motion picture. But Horner and Meyer fought for a new sound. Meyer wanted the music to capture seafaring and swashbuckling and the director and composer worked closely together. While Horner's style was likened to that of John Williams' Star Wars and Jerry Goldsmith's original Star Trek score, James did not use Jerry's main theme, instead he adapted the opening fanfare of Alexander Courage's Star Trek television theme. There are two principal themes used in the film, the Enterprise theme and the music for Khan, which really helped bolster the end battle so the audience know who is who when the two spaceships go head to head. The soundtrack was Horner's first major film score and was written in four and a half weeks. The resulting 72 minutes of music was then performed by a 91-piece orchestra. I still believe a film series should retain one main theme that should run throughout. Like I said in my reviews of Star Trek 3 and 6, I love Jerry's work and would have preferred if they kept some consistency to the music by bringing back his theme, but that doesn't mean what James Horner wrote wasn't good enough. I think it's a tremendous score and an impressive effort at such an early part of his career. However, the first six films are all over the place with their main themes, and I think they should have had a stronger connection once the first film was produced. If you listen carefully to the score, many of the musical cues James Horner used appear again in Krull and Aliens. An LP was released at the time and later reissued on CD, but to get the complete score you will need to hunt down the limited CD release from Intrada Records from 2009. James Horner sadly lost his life in a plane crash this year and it was a terrible loss to the film industry, an extremely talented composer who still had a lot to offer the art of film music. He has produced so many classic and great scores over the years. All film fans have at least one of his soundtracks in their collection. My first experience with Star Trek II was seeing it one night on TV as a kid and I recall being scared by it. Its use of dark red lighting and seeing Khan all beat up and bleeding by the end seemed so much darker than what I'd seen on the Generation show and the original series. The film takes on more adult themes with its execution and its context. It doesn't downplay its tone and remains consistent. It knows its audience and it's aiming for a mature viewer, though kids can certainly enjoy it for its premise and action sequences. The film had a stronger sense of excitement and adventure compared to the motion picture from 79, which left a bitter taste in audiences' mouths. Despite its huge budget and incredible effects, it plodded along at a slow pace and didn't really have a credible villain for Kirk to face up against. Now Kirk has met his match, a superhuman with high IQ. He has to face him again at an older age and to be put through the hardest test of his life, a no-win scenario. The Kobayashi test starts off the film and continues through to the end. I think Kirk is unaware he's being put through it again, but this time he can't cheat. It's such a great arc for the character. Even if he beats Khan, there's still going to be a loss, and sadly for Kirk, it's his best friend. Going with essentially a sequel to an old episode from the series was a very smart move. A, it pleases the fans, and B, shows they haven't ignored its origins and created a continuity. The film does expect you to know who Khan is to a large degree. The fans come first so they would instantly recognise the character and his past so the filmmakers would feel confident with the direction they are going, but for newcomers there is enough dialogue to provide a backstory and help viewers catch up. I'm glad they didn't use footage from the old series as flashbacks because the production is very different. I had no idea it was a continuation of an old episode until later on. As a kid I watched the films when they were on TV and some episodes of the classic show and now and again the Next Generation series. I never owned any of the movies on VHS so I wasn't a fan that would seek them out. I was more a Star Wars fan as a kid. I had the toys and the films were certainly more action packed and felt more exciting to me. As a kid you could go out and pretend to be Luke Skywalker or Han Solo. But with Star Trek, I didn't feel compelled to reenact scenes or pretend to be a 50 plus year old man. 
the film acknowledges their ages and doesn't pretend that they are not old. It plays it up and has fun with it sometimes, with Kirk pulling out his reading glasses in an attempt to hack the Reliant. The story realises they have moved on with their lives and shows Kirk being promoted but also having doubts about his position and finally finding out he has a son. His character has a lot to juggle throughout the movie and William Shatner does it with little to no effort, showing that he knows the character more than anyone. The end battle between Khan and Kirk is clearly a submarine battle in space, having to play cat and mouse with each other as they make their way through the nebula without any tracking systems in place, so they are fighting blind. It's an intense scene where Kirk has to outsmart Khan. Spock says Khan thinks in two dimensions, and for Kirk to win he must think in three dimensions. I think it's always difficult to create exciting action scenes with the Enterprise, as whenever you see them in the films it's always moving around slowly on screen, and only picks up speed when it warps and goes into light speed. So having this submarine inspired sequence seem fitting to play at the finale, and to have a plausible reason for them to hunt each other down at a slower pace. The death of Spock is certainly handled well, and brings out all the emotions needed to see Kirk at his lowest, losing his best friend, and for the audience to get behind him and feel the same loss. But it's difficult to know how many people actually knew he would return at the time, with the news in the press and Nimoy publicly saying he would return to calm the fans down. It essentially deflates the emotions of that scene, if you know he's not actually going to die. And with Star Trek 3 it clearly indicates from the title he is back, giving you no surprises. The production design still retains that 70s look the first film had, and feels a little like Logan's run, especially when you see Carol and David. Their costumes and the sets take on that very beige look, and it certainly dates the movie, but then there are moments when the set pieces feel like something out of Alien. Seti Alpha 5 and Khan's home look more in line with contemporary science fiction, but the Enterprise retains that slick, streamlined look that had already been established in that universe. The whole film seems far more fresh and appealing to look at, with the subtle changes. The changes made by the director Meyer to push the Navy-like aspect of the film, with the use of dialogue and costumes, seemed the right way to go. Replacing the pyjamas or onesie-like outfits seemed to make sense, and that design stayed with the series. A lick of paint can always make a big difference. Wrath of Khan is probably the best out of all the feature films. Any list you encounter online, 9 times out of 10, it's at the top, because the movie ticks all the right boxes to make the perfect Star Trek film. Is it my personal favourite? It's hard to say. It probably is. I really enjoyed number 3 and number 6 though, despite many people saying all the odd number films are crap, i.e. 1, 3 and 5. I still get a lot of fun out of the search for Spock. But I think what makes the Wrath of Khan tip over the edge to be the best is the villain. It's not a Klingon or an advanced AI, it's a human being, a genetically modified one but still a human being. So there you have the great opportunity to create a sense of drama and tension, making the conflict seem far more believable. The plot of Wrath of Khan was remade in Star Trek Nemesis, with Picard pitted against a clone of himself, having similar battle sequences, and seeing Data lose his life in a similar scenario to Spock. Then we have the recent Star Trek Into Darkness, which sees the return of Khan played by Benedict Cumberbatch. They tried to hide the fact that it was Khan in the advertising, but it was clearly obvious that it was him. Kirk loses his life at the end instead of Spock, but they do try to change things around so it wasn't a blatant carbon copy. Fans were annoyed at the writers attempts to shoehorn Khan so early into the new series, and it seemed like a lazy way to bait the fans. I think in the long run it seemed to have backfired. To me Khan appears to be Kirk's most popular adversary, so it's like Superman vs Zod. Khan was probably going to return to the franchise in some form or another, but so soon into the rebooted franchise? I think it was too early. But its criticisms weren't just because of Khan, it had a messy script overall. I enjoyed it when I first saw it, but never really felt compelled to watch it again. I really enjoyed the first flick by J.J. Abrams, and was a bit disappointed that Into Darkness didn't really live up to that quality. It's been over 30 years and Ratha Khan still retains its popularity. What makes the movie so appealing and entertaining is that it encapsulates everything that made the TV show work, but now it's all on a bigger scale. Having a director who wasn't a fan of the show and the franchise take the reins might seem to have a negative impact to the film, but it paid off. He focused on telling a good story and bringing out the best in the actors to give all the dramatic and emotional scenes weight to their delivery. 
Ricardo did a fantastic job with his character and the delivery of his lines. All of his scenes carry so much emotion and hate towards Kirk, making him an iconic villain. William Shatner himself pulls off one of the best performances from the long running series. He has to handle a lot of emotions and is totally convincing with his reliable portrayal. I felt Kirstie Alley was probably the weakest out of the new cast. She didn't really leave a lasting impression on me and the emotionless delivery of her lines didn't convince me she was a Vulcan. I was happy to see her character recast with Robin Curtis in parts 3 and 4 who did a far better job. Most people often start out with this film in the series and ignore the first flick, which is understandable because the movie makes no attempts to connect them. It feels like a fresh start. Ratha Khan set the groundwork and the direction for the series to go, and it struck a chord with audiences. It's always difficult translating a TV show to film, and there are always hiccups along the way, but it was a second attempt that made Star Trek work on the big screen. It's a classic movie with a great premise of revenge and discovery. And for Star Trek, well, that's a perfect cocktail for science fiction. It's Star Trek at its best. If I may be so bold, it was a mistake for you to accept promotion. Commanding a starship is your first best destiny. Anything else is a waste of material. I would not presume to debate you. That is wise. In any case, were I to invoke logic, logic clearly dictates that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. I did what you want. I stayed away. Can you ask me that? Were we together? Were we going to be? You had your world, and I had mine. And I wanted him in mine. I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you. And I wish to go on. I shall leave you as you left me, as you left her. My own for all eternity in the center of a dead planet. Very alive. Fire! Fire! Go through! From hell's heart, I stab at thee. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, this was the most Human. There are always possibilities, Spock said. And if Genesis is indeed life from death, I must return to this place again. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel. And also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.